So we're going to start off with, um, I mean, I think Canterbury's been highlighted as having a, a good digital culture, and um, I agree. Um, it hasn't always been that way. In fact, we used to um, have kind of difficult conversations with, uh, with, with departments often. Um, and uh, we've done a lot over the last year to kind of change that and um, really kind of push the, uh, the transformation agenda that we're, uh, that we're trying to go forward with. Um, so there's some kind of key, key things that we did. Um, thankfully, uh, now it comes from the top. So uh, the senior management team kind of buy into what we're doing. Um, they talk about it, they tell people, um, and that helps set kind of expectations um, with departments. Um, we communicate a lot internally, so uh, we have like internal blogs, um, so, um, uh, and we send everything around to staff to actually test for us, um, which, would, which kind of helps them feel involved. Um, we've got the right tools. We actually use Trello um, and Google, so it doesn't have to kind of cost you the earth, but it helps you kind of collaborate and, and, and get things moving. And finally, um, we bribe people with cake. Um, so it kind of often helps take that edge off of difficult conversations. We do that too. Yeah, 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 it, it works. But most importantly, what happened was um, a team was created. So you can see the, the lovely team there, or an illustration of us. Um, and we really believe that actually that was kind of like you know the, the key thing for us. Um, we could have all the technology, we can have the skills, we can have Trello or whatever. But actually, getting that team into one place, centralising it, so we can kind of work together and collaborate, it kind of you know that's what pushed us forward. So here's me. I think it's just gen like important for this role that they actually kind of get digital and they and they and they understand kind of what's needed. Um, but actually, a big part of what I do is kind of looking at requests that are coming in, looking at insight that we've got, spotting value, um, and then prioritising the backlog. As we work in a an, an agile team as well, it's important that um, I think that this role has those digital skills so they can kind of dive in and help out. The uh, digital content designer. This person takes those user needs that we've kind of formed, um, and they decide, you know, the best um, the best format for those uh, for those stories. I think services always want a web page, and a web page isn't always the right thing to do. Um, and they're just great at writing, essentially. Here's Isaac. Um, he's a real pe uh, people person. Um, in fact, he probably too much, um, wants to kind of speak, uh, speak to users all of the time. Um, but he's often kind of sketching boxes on bits of paper, lots of paper. He's got the messiest desk that you'll, um, uh, that you'll, that you'll find. Um, and he, rather than taking a process and trying to fix it, he kind of starts from the beginning, again, looks at the user need, uh, works out exactly what's needed to provide, um, to provide uh, both the user need and the, and the business goal. And he's always banging on about insight. Uh, the front-end web designer. This guy isn't a techie, crucially. Um, he knows HTML, he knows a bit of PHP or you know, some other language. Um, but again, he loves to prototype, so he's not the kind of person that will go in and build something, uh, spend a load of time building something. In fact, he will um, uh, take Isaac's uh, drawings and he'll may maybe colour them in with, with a pen or he'll um, get them onto Photoshop and kind of move things around and test it early. Um, and I think with that, uh, it helps us kind of stop, or well, it stops us making kind of costly mistakes potentially. Um, again, over the last year, we've been uh, working on kind of the platform for our digital services. So this is our new corporate website. Um, we've tried to make it kind of uh, transactional, um, getting people to where they want to go quickly, whether that's applying for something or, or reporting for something. And we've implemented TXM. We've got Report on Miss being uh, live at the moment. We've got um, Apply for Event Service. We've got uh, Bulky Waste, Fly Tipping. And we've launched a newsroom. So this is more about comms. It's uh, consultations and marketing and all that kind of stuff. And users can um, sign up to categories they're interested in and get notifications. I've given up on the speaker's notes now. I'm, I'm make, making this up. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the... Uh, our tourism website, so this is for uh, uh, local people um, as well as uh, people from abroad or people from um, uh, elsewhere in the country. Uh, and this has uh, events and places to stay and uh, 
uh, things you can do, uh, restaurant directories, all sorts. And this is, this is powered from, uh, from uh, Jardu Galaxies. And kind of moving forward, we're just going to be um, uh, now kind of built, now we've got the platform, pushing on with our digital services and really kind of redesigning those. And um, we start with our discovery phase, which is the most important. Um, and with that one, uh, we're looking at uh, using specific tar uh, targeted surveys rather than general "Do you like our website?" surveys that don't really tell you a lot. Uh, tracking actual usage with uh, analytics, uh, with Tag Manager, um, trying to understand kind of how people interact with stuff, and then again. Uh, use that insight to, to, to design improvements. Um, speaking to users, Isaac does a lot over the phone, a lot of face-to-face -face interviews. Um, he's always speaking to, uh, uh, to actual users of a service. Um, listen to internal departments, because although we now have ownership of our um, uh, digital agenda, actually they work quite closely with, um, on the front line, and they can give us decent uh, 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 insight. And then testing. Um, after we've got that insight, we'll move into the design phase. This is where Isaac frantically pulls the pencil from, from, from behind his ear and scribbles on, on paper and throws it behind his back and paper everywhere. But essentially, he's looking at a user need and he's trying um, to quickly uh, draw something out, work out if it works. If not, try again. Um, and as I, as I mentioned earlier, that's really about trying to stop spending weeks, potentially, on something that eventually won't work. And finally, the development stage, where we, um, we build that. Um, again, we test it, and then we launch our first iteration um, of that service, whatever it may be. So now I'm going to hand over to Isaac, who's going to introduce the, the next phase. So as Dave said, I'm a UX designer at Canterbury City Council. Um, and as he very strongly implied, I'm a bit of a chatterbox. I speak to our users a lot. And every now and then, I sketch something to justify my salary. Um, right, so uh, what I'm going to do is talk through uh, the experience of one of our customers um, when it came to trying to find out if they needed planning permission um, and trying to find out how to apply for planning permission. And uh, I'm going to do that as a way of illustrating some of the methods we use uh, as a council um, for redesigning our services, um, but also because uh, we need help. Uh, planning, the planning stuff on our website is uh, far from ideal. So after I'm, I've talked through that, we're actually going to get you doing some hands-on exercise uh, where we ask you to take the user needs that we illustrated by talking through that customer's journey and then uh, sketch out a new process or an idea that would have improved that customer's journey. Uh, please don't think that's a scary thing. It's a throwaway sketch, it doesn't have to be beautiful. It could just be a series of boxes with arrows between them and annotations. Um, can I just uh, ask, can everyone put their hand up who uh, works at a council that deals with planning permission? Oh, brilliant. Um, so I think there was maybe only one table where there's people who maybe don't know much about planning, so we'll try and make sure we get around to you. But uh, the Actually, you don't need to know a great deal about it, to be honest. Um, we don't. <laughs> uh, it's, too, it's too mysterious. But uh, in a way, so um, I'll talk through the customer's journey, uh, and uh, then we'll get on to practical stuff. So um, just a little bit of background to the research we did around planning. We kicked it off uh, by traveling to London. Uh, there was a show and tell by an organization called Future Cities Catapult. Um, and some London boroughs where they had done some research into planning and had done a sort of design sprint to try and improve uh, the planning customer journey. And the reason we did that is I, myself and our kind of customer uh, liaison in the planning department went up together to first of all try and copy what they'd done uh, and secondly to get into the frame of mind that you can do different things with planning. So um, for those of you who have any uh, knowledge of what planning is like on websites and dealing with planning departments, uh, there's often a perception, I think, that you can only really do it one way, and a lot of council websites uh, do planning very, very similarly, and uh, we're just not finding that's really working uh, for our customers. 
we've, uh, we also looked at some internal data and basically we decided to focus on what we call our hidden customers, which is ordin ordinary members of the public who maybe aren't making the planning applications, but they are the ones who are trying to work out if they need it. And they're actually um, most of our phone calls uh, around planning. Um, but more importantly, uh, they're not... Um, they're not making money out of this, this isn't their business, they just, they just uh, want to get on and make a change to their house and that's, that's important that we enable that. And our methodology was uh, phone interviews. So we phoned back people who had phoned us about planning uh, and uh, asked them to sort of reconstruct their experience, talk us through step by step what they did. Uh, reason we did that is because uh, we could have done a survey or something but it's really hard to frame survey questions when you, when you don't really know uh, what the problems are that customers are facing. So interviews are a really good way of uh, very quickly getting an in-depth understanding of a process. Uh, click, please. So our focus is Sir Stephen. Um, I haven't given his surname, so I'm hoping he's still kind of anonymous. Uh, he's, uh, he's a knight of a realm, um, and uh, uh, all round a pretty cool guy. Um, so if you could uh, click again. Uh, yeah, so um, he's an ex-civil servant, very quite a senior civil servant. Um, he now has a similarly kind of intellectual job. So basically he's uh, professional, he's capable, uh, but uh, even he frankly struggled to get anywhere with our planning process. And um, the reason we chose for Stephen when we did a number of interviews, the reason we chose him was first of all he gave us a lot of detail, uh, which is useful. Uh, and secondly, he uh, was quite his pro, his um, experience was quite representative of customers, and I think also it uh, illustrates that improving online content is not just about uh, trying to deal with a small segment of customers who maybe don't have you know uh, a great deal of online literacy or who um, need things explaining more clearly. Some of the brightest minds in our country can't understand the planning information on our website. Uh, and so I think that's quite a powerful example. Um, uh, so uh, could you click, please? This was Sir Stephen's problem. He needs a new boiler. He needs to replace his boiler. Uh, and to do that, he needs to run up a flue up the side of his house. I'm not a homeowner, and I don't I try not to do any DIY, so I don't really get what that means. But um, uh, <laughs> I think the important thing is he needs to alter something. Um, and in his mind, that's not a planning application as such. That's not how he saw it initially in a way. Uh, he just saw it as a necessary thing he needs to do to change his house. So he's not, he didn't start off his process with uh, uh, the terminology that we're used to. Technically, he started his journey a couple of months ago, did a bit of initial research, realized it was going to be a mission, and gave up. But he more recently came back to it. He started off in Google, searching Canterbury planning. Uh, someone mentioned earlier that like 80% um, of their customers don't look at their homepage on their website. Uh, that's the same with us, and it's because most people start their journeys by like Googling or through some other search uh, method. He came to our site, uh, tried to log in with his what he thought were his details, uh, was unable to log in, <clears throat> uh, which was a little frustrating for him. Uh, he then kind of looked back for his emails because he had been receiving some emails about planning uh, into his Gmail account. He actually then found the planning portal details and realized, of course, Common sense, there's a whole separate website uh, for this. Um, and uh, felt pretty lucky because he was then able to log into the planning portal using uh, those details. We think but what he had found on our website was like public access, which is like uh, where you look at uh, and comment on applications and stuff. Um, so he then starts looking through the planning portal content. Uh, by the way, just to say, all of this information is on your table, so have a look afterwards. I'm not expecting you to remember all of this. Um, and uh, really, his like, uh, way of looking at the Planning Portal website was to look for something, just something that seemed familiar. Uh, and the first two words he saw that struck home were listed building. So, so Stephen lives in a listed building. Very nice, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, he got an impression from the content about listed buildings that he would need to make a paper application rather than an online application. Uh, if you could click, please. We think that's, we did a little bit of looking afterwards and we think that's because the planning portal uh, bits about listed buildings, if you find it um, 
like offhand, um, it's part of like guidance material. So it's not, uh, it doesn't sit next to like the application bit. So we think he basically got the impression that it was like a maybe a separate offline process. So this is the first time he calls us as a council. He says, uh, how do I make a paper application? And our helpful customer service people said, uh, no, uh, you can do it online. They told him how to navigate to the online bit. And he does. Uh, so he starts his planning application uh, and starts, uh, this is where the fun starts. He starts guessing at how to answer the questions in the application. So he has questions like, um, does this involve changes indoors? And he says, well, yeah, I'm replacing my boiler. Um, but he's not quite sure if he should say yes, because maybe the planning application doesn't relate to the indoor work, because planning's about how your house looks, right? So, um, but he, so he's really, the point is he's kind of guessing at how to answer these questions. Um, does it involve external changes? Yep, can answer that one pretty confidently. Does it involve changes to the fixtures and fittings? Yep. Does it involve, uh, does it require the use of materials? That was a question that made him laugh when he talked to me about that on the phone because without getting philosophical, most things involve materials. Um, we haven't evolved enough to just be working in a virtual sphere, I don't know. But uh, so, um, the point was what he was struggling with is sort of the unclear questions and a lack of clarity about, because he doesn't really know what a planning application is as such yet, if he's meant to ask, answer questions about all of his work or is it just the bit that maybe requires planning which he kind of doesn't know in a way. Uh, he's making a good number of calls at this stage, getting some really good customer service. Uh, what he says as well, um, and this is a customer want maybe rather than a customer need, but he says it would be really helpful to be able to track those conversations um, so that he could kind of not lose the thread. He felt that he lost the thread between the different conversations he had. Um, I don't want you to like, we always think we shouldn't just do what the customer asks us to do, but perhaps that points to an underlying need uh, for that customer in terms of uh, maybe they needed to tie their guidance together somehow or have their advice in one place. Certainly, um, we thought that was interesting. Nearly at the end now. It was more interminable for Sir Stephen, I can assure you. Uh, he now needs to, he now comes to a stage where he needs to upload a design and access statement. He doesn't know what that is. More for him. Um, and, uh, but he finds a link uh, that looks like it might explain to him what that is. Uh, in fact, the link just gives him uh, the name of three companies that could do this work for him. Uh, he doesn't feel qualified to choose between those three companies. He didn't realize he was gonna have to buy this thing. Um, and uh, you know, he's an entrepreneurial kind of guy, wants to do it himself. So um, he tries two things. First of all, uh, oh yeah, click please, Dave. So first of all, he, he tries three things actually. First of all, he tries to find out more about it on Google. He finds some regulations about design and access statement. Kind of explains what it is, but doesn't really make it clear why it's relevant to him because it, it seems like it's for a bigger kind of planning application. Uh, they don't really match the project size in his mind. The next thing he tries to do is just uh, upload some photos with a drawing on showing where the pipe would go. Uh, that he's, not, he's not able to do that. Um, and so finally he, uh, calls up a pal who's a bit of an expert and says, I'll do a DNA for you. I'll do a design and access statement for you. It's gonna cost you. Um, and so that's where he's at really. Um, he's paid someone to do a design and access statement for him. Something he never knew he would need uh, when he first decided to replace his boiler. Um, yep, click please, Dave. So just a quick overview of where Sir Stephen is now as of a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he's, not, he's not quite sure what fee he's going to pay overall. Um, he has just recently thought about um, switching to like the pre-planning process where you can like um, upload a, a draft version of your planning application and get some feedback on it, but felt that was too intense. Uh, he might as well just do the, the normal planning application. Um, and uh, he's pretty frustrated really. Um, and I think... Uh, Based on his feedback, uh, click please. And what he told us, his main process pains and the reason he's frustrated is because he's kind of had to guess all the way through. 
Uh, when he started the process, he didn't really know what it would involve, what he'd need to do. There have been hidden costs and hidden needs, um, quite complicated things that he didn't realize he'd have to do. Uh, and also terminology has been a big problem for him, understanding the wording around planning. So, all that information is on the sheets that we put on your desk. They're quite rough and ready because uh, um, maybe I could have been a little bit less lazy and made something pretty for you, but I've just pulled it out of the research we did. So it's quite an honest reflection of how we've been trying to work. Um, and that basically is a step-by-step uh, -step guide to Sir Stephen's journey and some of the issues he's had. So what we'd like you to do is use that to try and come up with uh, an idea or a new process or a new step-by-step -step journey that would have uh, helped Sir Stephen find the Holy Grail and make that planning application.